invite you this morning to uh, turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke. Luke, of course, Luke chapter 6, uh, reading uh, verses 46 through uh, 49. Luke chapter 6, 46 through 49. Let me read the passage, then we'll pray. I think you'll be encouraged by our time uh, in the book of Luke today. We're going to conclude the morning with the Lord's Supper, so you can begin even preparing your hearts now if you haven't done so. For that time, Luke chapter 6, verse 46, these are the words of Jesus, and it says this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And when the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Pray with me if you would, please. And God, as we do so, we invite you to teach us. Uh, these are not mere words that are uh, for uh, historical consumption. They're not words that are uh, designed to uh, pique our interest. They're words that are designed to transform our lives, and we ask that your spirit would do that through it. In this time, amen. So just a little confession as we get going this morning. Uh, not a personal confession. This is just a, a broad, general confession. An observation maybe is a better word. I have never met uh, in my life a person, an individual, who set out on purpose with the intention to ruin their life. Never met, never met that person. I've never met a person who said, my goal is to do my very best to absolutely bring destruction and ruin upon my life. Haven't met that person. I've never met anybody who hired a life coach and said to that life coach, my goal is devastation. Show me the way. <laughs> Doesn't happen. I've never uh, counseled with someone who was in the midst of a crisis, and they, were, they said to me, Donovan, my, my hope, uh, the reason that I'm here today is because my hope was to have generally a fairly stable, secure life uh, seasoned with uh, moments of complete and utter ruin. It doesn't happen. However, the reality is, is that many, many people find themselves in just that position. You or someone you know are at a place in life where you would say things are not going well. Or if maybe it's not the entirety of your life, you would say that either right now or a particular point in your life, there's been a moment where it was complete and total wreckage. And so let's just observe collectively together. People don't set out with that objective in mind. People don't set out with that goal in mind. People don't say, I'm going to do everything that I can to com come to a place where I, I am filled with regret because of the devastation of, of my decisions. But it happens, and it happens all the time. It happens all the time. And so the question that I, that I pose to us is, how does that happen? Why does that happen? Why? It may be the better question is, how, how can you, knowing that nobody sets out with that intention, but nevertheless we find ourselves there, how do we prevent that from happening? Thankfully, uh, Jesus gives the answer to that question in our passage this morning. Uh, what, what he makes very clear, what Jesus makes crystal clear, is that the answer to that question, the answer to... Uh, destruction avoidance is found completely in him. The, the way, the antidote, the solution to finding ourselves in a position of ruin is him. If you don't know this, then I'm, I'm happy to be able to tell you this, that the Bible has a very, very clear message about this person of Jesus. And the, the message is that Jesus is human, yes, but he's not just a human. The message of the Bible is that Jesus is a phenomenal teacher, but he's not just a phenomenal teacher. The, the uh, overwhelming message, undeniable message 
about Jesus in the Bible is that Jesus is the Lord of the universe. Jesus is Lord. And so what that means is, in all of the universe, there is no one greater than him. If there were a, uh, a, a chart of authority, he's, at the, he's not only at the top, there's a massive gap between Jesus and everybody else. Jesus is supreme. He's the ultimate authority. All of creation, there's not a single facet of creation that isn't subject to Jesus. Jesus is Lord. If you don't believe me, listen to a few verses. If you're a quick writer, you can uh, write down these references. Uh, Jesus' birth, the very announcement of his birth, Luke chapter 2, verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, not just a Savior, but he is Christ the Lord. He is the ultimate authority in the universe. Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... Jesus, you are supreme over all creation. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So there's an element of salvation where we come into relationship with Christ, where we acknowledge the fact that he is Lord. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says this, there is one Lord, not many lords, not multiple lords. There is one Lord who happens to be Jesus Christ, and this is a great picture, through whom all the things Uh, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. The point of the passage essentially being that if Jesus stops being Lord, everything in creation stops existing. He is that important. He is that supreme. 1 Peter 3.15 says, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. So Christ uh, the Lord, we should view him differently, and because we view him differently, he's holy, he's set apart, he's distinct from everything else, and when we come to that awareness, when we honor Christ, uh, or when we recognize that it's holy, then we're going to give him a, a, a position, easy for me to say, of honor. I sounded like Porky Pig for a second there. <laughs> a p- 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 position. One more, one more passage from Philippians, or Philippians, uh, chapter 2, <laughs> says this about Jesus. There will be a time, there will be a moment, it is going to happen, it is certain, it is sure, where at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That covers all the territory. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess. What What is the confession? That Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is Lord. In in all of creation, in the scheme of of positions and people, there is one that is infinitely above and beyond all others. It is Jesus. And so that message that Jesus is Lord has massive implications. Sometimes you hear things and you can decide what you're going to do with it. Other times you hear things and it demands a response. The fact that Jesus is Lord absolutely necessitates a response. It's not like the fast food place is having a sale on burgers and we can just choose to ignore it. It's not as though we're hearing the news about uh, the NFL hiring a new coach. It's not, it's, it's something that when you hear that information, it's such a weighty truth It requires that you personally respond to that truth. You can't put it on the shelf. You can't come back to it later. You can't be a casual observer of that truth. It is so significant. It is so weighty. You can't ignore it. It demands all of our attention, and it demands a response. We have to decide what we're going to do with that truth if Jesus truly is what the Bible says that he is and is Lord. That's precisely the issue Jesus is getting at in his question. Verse 46, let me remind you of his question. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? I love, love, love this question. It is a really good question. Why in the world would you call me Lord and not do what I tell you to do. 
Simple question, but a solid, really good question. I want to draw a picture for you because I think that it's helpful for us to remember where, where Jesus is and where he's positioning himself in, in this question. Let's, uh, let's talk about the who. And so if Jesus is human, I'm going to show you a, a uh, I don't know what the word I'm trying to show you, a progression, that's the word, it took me a second. Jesus, at bare minimum, is a human. We could say that we recognize that Jesus is a good teacher. Let's up the game a little bit. Let's say that Jesus is a miracle worker. And then lastly, let's, let's make it even further. Anybody have any idea? Lord. Who, who we believe Jesus is, there is absolutely an expected correlation depending on the answer to this question. And the correlation has to do with obedience. Obedience. Let me tell you what I mean. In terms of obedience, if Jesus is a mere human, do you do, do you do whatever anybody tells you to do? No. Okay. Uh, Shelly, you were shaking your head very confidently. My wife, I'm speaking. Sometimes. Okay. Yeah, she's like, heck no, heck no I don't do what people tell me to do. Okay. Were you thinking of me? Okay. You know this to be true. There are people in your life who, because they're merely humans, you many, many times choose to completely disregard what they have to say. Right? That's just how it happens. If Jesus is a good teacher, then, uh, so let's say, uh, you know, I, I can choose. If Jesus is a, is a good teacher, or maybe a brilliant teacher, then that, that compels me a little bit more to say, maybe I should listen to what he has to say. You in your life, there are people that you respect more than others. And so because of perhaps their reputation, because of their knowledge, because of their experience, you're more inclined to listen to what they have to say in terms of obedience. Hopefully, if there's a, a lawyer you respect or admire and you're going to them for legal advice, you're probably be going to be more inclined to listen or perhaps a doctor. There are people who you recognize there's some source of, of knowledge within them that compels you to maybe be choosy. A miracle worker, on the other hand, you begin to see this person clearly is unlike other people. And so because of that, I'm probably more inclined when somebody, there's some sort of demonstration that this person is not just human and not just wise or good, but there's something perhaps supernatural about them or beyond normal about them that would compel me to listen. And so you can see the progression in terms of obedience. And what Jesus is saying is, if I am truly Lord, then I'm not just a human. And you can willfully choose to disregard me or ignore me. I'm not just a good teacher. Remember, Jesus, at this particular point in, in the book of Luke, he's just finished a series of sermons and teachings. And what he's trying to say is, I'm not just a teacher like any other teacher. I'm not just a miracle worker. I am Lord. And if you're going to call me, if you're, if you're, you can call me man, and that's great. You can call me good teacher. That's fantastic. You can call me miracle worker. But if you call me Lord... Why would you not do what I tell you to do? Why? Because any, any, any other way that you would relate to me, you can choose whether or not you listen. You can take it, you can take it as maybe uh, advice or wise counsel. But if you call me Lord, if I am who I say I am, if I am... Lord of the universe, 
If I am sovereign over all creation, if everything in heaven and earth bows to me, if everything is subject to me, how in the world could you ignore what I have to say? Why wouldn't you do what I tell you? I can see if you think I'm any of these other things, then listen if you want. But I am not any of those other things. I am Lord. I am King. It makes no sense not to. If, if, if we say Jesus is Lord, but don't do what he says, it, that's nonsense. And if Jesus is Lord, I have to say, Jesus, you are, you are my ultimate authority, and I'm going to submit to you. I acknowledge that you are sovereign over all creation, including my life. I'm not in charge of my life. You're in charge of my life. I'm not in control. You're in control. I would be an absolute fool to ignore whatever you tell me to do. Why would I do that? And Jesus says there's an awful lot at stake as to whether or not we do what he tells us to do. Let's go back to our passage. Luke chapter 6, verse 47. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them... So if you do come to me and you do hear his words and you do what he says to do, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And when a stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Some, some of your church people, you probably, anybody have a song come to mind? Don't build your house on the sandy land. Don't build it too near the shore. Oh, it might be kind of nice, but you'll have to build it twice, so you have to build that house once more. <laughs> anybody? Okay. One, two people, three people. Really? That's it? You got to build your house upon the rock. Lay a good foundation on the solid rock. Oh, the storms may come and go. No, but I, how do you, I'm not, I wasn't even a church kid and I know the song. I came to know Christ when I was 16 and where is that in my, that's strange. I'm going to have to dig deep and find out where that came from. Anybody ever build a house? Okay, a few of you have built a house. Uh, Shelly and I, we've been in you know, Pace in 25 years or so. We've, we've built three houses over the years. And every time, do you know what, do you know what builders do? They, built, they, they build it on a good foundation. And it makes pe- perfect sense. It's a great illustration. This yes, last house we built, we're over on Mud Springs, and it was a little bit, it was a little bit squishy. Uh, that's probably not a... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, if you're a geologist, don't hate me. (laughs) Muddy. You know, it's it's over by Mud Springs, so that kind of makes sense. And so we had to excavate, and it was still a little bit, there was a lot of rain. It was still, you'd go through it, and equipment would sink. And so we had to dig deeper and deeper and deeper until eventually, guess what we found? Rock. And so the foundation guys are like, okay, we dug deep now. Now we're on the rock. Now you can build the house. It, what I love about this illustration is Jesus says, uh, he's like a man building a house, and then this flood comes. And, and here's, the, here's the interesting thing about the observation is you can, I can, Shelly and I could have built our house on a very poor foundation, and it would have looked good for a while. It would have. But eventually, something would have happened. There would be some settling. There would be some shifting, some movement. And eventually, we would have woken up in the morning, and there would be like, you know, crack going down the wall. A couple years later, that crack would get get wider and wider. The next thing you know, your your bed's kind of like this, and you roll (laughs) off the bed. That's the way foundations work. 
in, in Jesus in his illustration here, he's, he's trying to help us to understand that there, there absolutely is a necessity for a solid foundation. Anybody been watching the news of the storms in California? And houses that are either on the beach or on a, on a hillside. Some of them are just going away. And I love the illustration because a lot of times we can, we can go through life and things look good on the outside. But here's what I know and here's what you know. There's going to be a moment in your life where that storm comes. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to test your foundation. Some of you might be there now. If you're not there now, you've probably been there at some point in life. Because you can, you can buy some time with a shaky foundation and nobody really knows. And, and you don't even really know. But there will be a moment where the very core of your existence gets tested. And it's going to determine your, the stability of your life depending on what you built a foundation on. And this, this beautiful illustration that Jesus is giving is that if you, if you build your life on anything other than me, it will always be, at best, a shaky foundation. We could go back to our, our picture and maybe say, uh, foundation. Because the truth is, if I view Jesus merely as a human... And because he's merely a human, I choose to disregard, ignore, listen at will. Then at best, the foundation of my life is going to be shaky and vulnerable. However, there is another alternative. There's another option. I can understand who I am. I can understand who Jesus is. And when I do that... There's all kinds of implications. There is, if you don't know this, there is a distinct difference between you and Jesus as Lord. And, and if I view him merely as a human and I choose his will at will, my foundation at best is going to be shaky. But if I can say, Jesus, you are Lord, and I'm going to be perfectly obedient or best possible, then there is a solid foundation that comes from him and through him, because the, the difference is, and I could just maybe uh, think for, for a moment, I, I don't know everything, but Jesus does. If I'm living my life based upon my own knowledge because I'm choosing to disregard Jesus, at some point my knowledge is going to come up short. I'm imperfect. Jesus is perfect as a Lord. I, I can't see all of time. All I can see and, and what, what consumes my, my, my thoughts and my attention is the immediate now. But Jesus sees past and he sees present and future. And when I can acknowledge that's, that's part of his lordship then, and I can, I can rest in him and trust in him, then, then that puts me in a, a better, stable position. My heart, the Bible says, and it's true, my heart is deceitfully wicked. And what that means is there's, there are times in life where my heart convinces me something is best. And guess what? It's not best. And so I desperately need the lordship of Jesus for him to say this is what's best. Even when I don't understand it, even when I maybe don't agree with it, to understand that he knows more than I do. He is, he is perfect. He is sinless. He is wise. He, he sees all. He is in control of all. And the more I can wake up in the morning... And say, Jesus, you are Lord, not only Lord of creation, but Lord of my life. The more I am going to find that I live life with a solid foundation. To where, to where I'm probably going to avoid challenges and difficulties because I'm not sticking my foot in stuff. But also when, when those storms do rise, I can... There's a stability and there's a security because he's Lord and I'm submitting to him. Let me tell you what I absolutely know to be true. I know this to be true about you because I know a lot of your stories and I know this to be true about myself because I know my own story. Undeniable. If, and, and, and hopefully those of you who know me, you wouldn't say, Donovan, your life is a total wreck. Uh, 
But I will say this. There are moments or seasons of my life that are wreckage. There are moments where my wife looks at me and says, you're a jerk. And she's right. There are moments of my life where I've made bad, foolish decisions. There are moments of my life, and maybe not the entirety of my life is ruin and destruction, but there have been moments or seasons where I go, oh, I, that was a bad idea. And I can, without a doubt, tell you that the, the common factor in those moments were always when I refused to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord over my life and I chose to be disobedient to him. If you were to chart those moments, if you were to look back at Donovan's timeline and, says, and say, this one was really bad and this one was even worse, the, the common factor in each of those moments was I was choosing to disregard the lordship of Christ and I was disobedient to his good and perfect work in my life. Here's what I know to be about, true about people. People who maybe you would say the entirety of their life seems to be in ruin. What I've seen to be true absolutely is because there has been a consistent pattern of disregarding the lordship and obedience to Christ. And one thing led to another, which led to another, which led to another, which unsurprisingly re resulted in destruction of life. It is true. What, what Jesus is saying is absolutely true, that the common denominator, if you want to have, at best, a shake, shaky foundation in life, disregard the lordship of Jesus. Now, understanding that Jesus is far more than a, a human and a good teacher and a miracle worker, but understanding that he's Lord doesn't mean that life is easy. It doesn't mean that life is problem-free. But it, what it does mean is that our life is being built on something that's eternal, on something that's good, on something that's beautiful, on a person who knows us, on a person who wants good for us, on a person who understands life and how life is best lived. And the more you and I can say, Jesus, you are Lord, I am not. I submit to you. You tell me what to do. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do my best to follow you. You absolutely are going to find solid foundation. Not problem free, because the storms will come. Storms are going to erode at, at the foundation a little bit, but the foundation's going to stand. It's going to remain. And so my encouragement for us this morning is just to make a declaration. We have a choice every single day of our lives uh, when we wake up in the morning to decide who's in charge of our life. You right now, today, whether or not you knew it, are living as though somebody is in, in charge of your life. Is it you? Or is it Christ as Lord? If it's you, my question is, how's that working for you? It might be working for a while, but at some point it's going to let you down. So let's declare this morning as we transition into the Lord's Supper this morning, the band's going to come up. Let's make, a, let's make a, a group declaration. What a great thing for us to do together to say uh, in our hearts, Jesus, you are Lord. Let's declare this morning that we're going to build our lives on solid foundation that is Jesus. Let's declare this morning as we remember who he is and what he's done, that he's worthy of total obedience. Band's going to play a little bit. Uh, there's some communion elements up here. On either side, there's some on the back walls. Encourage you whenever you're ready. Don't feel like you have to rush, but whenever you're ready, go grab some of those and return to your seat. And then uh, we'll partake of the elements together. Oh. 
before we take the elements, would you do a little self-inventory, quiet your hearts, maybe close your eyes? Would you ask the question, if you haven't already, is, is Jesus in a position in your life today, right now, where he is Lord? Is there an, an area of your life where you haven't submitted to his lordship? Maybe there's been obedience in many areas of your, of your life or most areas of your life, but there's a, one or two that you've yet to be obedient to him. Maybe you're not ready to hand that over quite yet, but would you at least acknowledge the struggle with him? Be honest and say that there's an area of your life that you, you know you need to surrender, but you, you're battling. Jesus collectively as a group of people we recognize and we all I think are are prone to lose sight of the fact that there is one such as you who is far above all creation there is one such as you who is holy and perfect there is one such as you who is worthy of complete and total surrender and obedience Father pro prone to wonder Lord we feel it but we return in this moment recognizing the value of a solid foundation that can only be found in you we confess with our mouths this morning that Jesus is Lord so would you take the bread representative of his body broken for us the the Lord the king of all creation sacrificing himself out of his love. Let's eat in remembrance of him. And the juice, representative of his blood, spelt out necessary for a sacrifice to offer forgiveness of sin, a, a great gift of the Lord of all. Let's drink in remembrance of him. stand with us. We're going to sing this together.
we declare that you are Lord. Jesus, we don't want to just be people who sing about this. We want to be people who live this. So I pray you be glorified by our lives, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, hey, it was great to be with you today. Don't forget, we have a meet and greet next door. If you're new or newish around here, I'm going to be over there. I would love to have a chance to meet you, so head on over next door right now, I guess. See you next week.